our main cinematographer, she is amazing. And then I had a secondary uh, camera person because we only had 13 days to shoot. And so I was like, I was like, Bob, you're my special ops. You got to come in and just spray down the whole location like a nature documentary um, because we don't have time doing that. I was like, here's this camera. All our nice equipments with a with a unit. Sorry, take the sandbag. Use that instead of a tripod. And Bob did just the most incredible, incredible work. Um, he's really why we were able to finish in 13 days of filming because my AD and I had broken it down, and we were like, okay, we need 20 days of filming, and then. My pocketbook and I broke it down, and we we're like, "We have we have 13 days of filming, uh, and what do we do?" You know. Oh, uh, no, you will definitely have to talk about some of that because I'll have to, you know, we, I can reference the way you shot your movie, the way I shot my first feature in like 13, 14 days, I think, we're trying to rush through and shoot everything because that's as many days as I could budget. So I know exactly. Yep. <laughs> you, you feel me? So like, it was it was just kind of like okay, we're doing this, but, you know, and, and it was just funny because the entire time my AD was like, are we doing this? Are we doing this? Because, like, you know, Bob was off on the own, just kind of, like, wandering through the woods with a camera, and what we would do is every night we would check the footage. He would just unload, and it's funny because, you know, with your A unit and got your actors, it's like, okay, three, four takes, whatever. Bob, who was just kind of let loose, he'd unload, like, four hours of footage, and the like two hours of it would be him just trying to get focus with his like, you know, with his like janky rig. But then when he would like, get his shot, it was just like, I was like, shoot, man, we should be licensing this to like National Geographic or something. Cause it's just like gorgeous. And, and he got all these like close ups of bugs. And it was just, it was really awesome. He, he was, and so he's my, he's my Georgia special unit. I, I, I called him in. I was like, Georgia, we need you. Come on in. And he, he delivered hard. He's also, a, uh, he was an Eagle Scout. So it's super cold and rainy and whatever. Our little actress is freezing. He builds a fire while it's raining. Like, I was like, how are you doing that? <laughs> you know? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, since, uh, I don't want to get too far into this conversation already without introducing everything. Because I'll cut out. Okay, okay. Before. But uh, first of all, uh, welcome to Something Wicked Film Festival. Uh, what we're going to do is just talk about your little your, your film. I can't even say little film because yours is a feature film. So we're going to talk about your your film. Um, but first, I want you to tell everybody who you are, what the name of your film is, and what you did on your film. Okay. Hello, I'm Corey Choi, and my film is Esme, My Love. Um, I was the co-writer, uh, director, co-producer on the film. So um and also the sound designer and mixer so uh it's really uh i had a lot of lot of roles with it you know it's it's my film but i had a whole lot of very important collaborators on it so uh having done so many roles in this film what what did you find the most difficult out of all the roles you know i think that it's funny because for the last 15 years as a supervising sound designer and a sound mixer and a producer, uh, you always work on somebody else's films and you help them achieve their vision. And you're like, Oh, I could do this this way. If I was directing, I could do this this way if I was directing. And then when I got into the director's seat, it's like all the knowledge just kind of flew out of my head. And I was like, who am I? Where am I? You know, it was so intense. Um, I, I had done a lot of preparation for this film. Um, uh, it was a three-year writing process, and we actually wrote to the space um, once once we found the space. So it was like two years just trying to find the concept. Then we found location, and we spent a year rewriting it to the space. So that, as I said, a whole lot of pre-production because I had a very, very tight budget. I wanted to make a feature film, but um, it was a very, very tight budget, so I knew I had to really plan ahead as much as possible so i came in very very confident um and then just when things went wrong so as they do on set sometimes i think the most challenging thing was not i was also the main producer which is uh very difficult you need that kind of uh left brain right brain divide and so one of the most challenging things for me was trying to solve logistical problems
all I would. And uh, if if I could do anything differently, and with that film again, I would have had a more you know. Th- there were some associate producers, co-producers, unit production manager. They were all essential. But I would have had like a serious, like full-fledged producer there, 100% of the time. And I will never make another film without a full-fledged <laughs> producer, uh, uh, you know, next to me because I usually play that role. I am that full-fledged producer for the directors, and I know how much uh, they lean on me. And I thought because I did that for so many people, I I, I didn't necessarily need it. I needed it. <laughs> So I, I would say that was probably the biggest the, the biggest challenge was it was um, coming in uh, a little uh, just a little too overconfident in my ability to split my brain. Yeah, I, well, I understand that <laughs> you say that and like we were talking before, uh, we have a lot of similarities in that my first film I had the same issue because I thought I could do it all too. I, I was producer because I had been production manager on I think four or five features before I actually decided to do my feature and uh, realized that, oh, you know what? I had a, a small so a producer who was really just an associate producer who just kind of helped out, maybe gave me uh, uh, an idea on a camera angle here and there, but not really instrumental in keeping my set like calm and, uh, you know, organized and flowing all the time. Thankfully, I uh, had a very limited cast. <laughs> uh, <laughs> On my film, I was smart because the biggest cast I've ever worked with was about 75 people uh, for a wow. feature. And that was crazy managing that many people. So I said, you know what? I'm not going to do it on my film. I have five cast members. That's it. I can manage uh, that I, myself. No. I, I feel... <laughs> I feel that too. We actually only had two cast members. So we have we have Audrey Grace Marshall and we've got Stacey Wexstein who are both phenomenal. But Audrey was a nine year old girl at the time. And there's a lot of challenges filming with 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 children. You got to make sure you're not overworking them. You got to make sure they can do their schoolwork. Um, when you are working with a, a child, it's almost like a partnership. Yes, you're working with the child actor but you're also working with their guardian. It's kind of like a, their guardian is, is also there as an equal partner in this, right? So I was working with Audrey, but just as much I was working, if not more, I was working with, with Heidi, her mother, um, who was there as her guardian and also her, her kind of just everything, right? Her guardian, her quasi manager, her acting coach, her tutor, and uh, her, her like makeup consultant. I mean, Heidi was kind of a force of nature. And I think one of the things that I was really fortunate actually is that Heidi had been through it before with lots of, with Audrey, because Audrey's a very talented um, little girl. And she had actually been on a couple feature films before at, at the age of nine, she had already done a couple feature films before she came to my set. And um, because of that, uh, Audrey was just kind of a joy to work with. She she found the material new. She kind of played, but the logistics of getting her there. And I'm very, very fortunate, actually. Uh, Audrey is now, um, she's starring in a Paramount Plus show called The Fairly Odd Parents. She's the, she's the leading role and she's SAG and, and all that. I was the last production that got her before she was SAG. Um, and while I'm all about union productions, I'm all for them. My my production was so small, we, we couldn't have afforded to to go with all the the union, um, just to, just all the the union things that are very important, obviously. But my budget was so small, and and the production was so small, uh, we would never have been able to to afford to have um, Audrey as our actress. So we were very fortunate, and in fact, actually. Uh, as soon as she finished with us, she went on to filming uh, on Jessica Jones. Like as as soon as she she and then right after Jessica Jones, she went on to the flight attendant. So uh, it was it was just kind of cool. So I was thinking, you know, when we first started, oh cool, Audrey's going to be this movie, this this um, you know, it's going to be great for her career. It took us so long to finish it. By the time because um, we shot 2018. Um, by the time we finished it, she's already got, you know, uh, she's been nominated for a SAG award. She started her own series, um, but she's still a big fan of, 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 of the, of the, the movie, which is, is which is great. We've been in touch and, and um, it's just funny because she came back to 
finish up some ADR lines. And I was like, who is this giant in my, in my booth here? Who is this giant, giant girl? Because she's sitting there 12 years old and, you know, between nine years old and 12 years old, it's just a big difference. So yeah, it was challenging. Um, there were some challenges with, 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 with shooting with, with a, a young child for sure. Um, but she, as an actress, was able to make them kind of go away once we actually were able. I think the challenges are how logistically do you get the child there in position? Um, but once she was there, she was ready to go. She was just in it to win it. And that was awesome. Well, that's one of the good things about your film, because both her and uh, the actress that plays her mother, I can't remember her name off hand. Stacy. Stacy. They had such a great rapport in the film that, and they carry the whole movie. So it's uh, it's amazing to see these two together, and they they just gel perfectly throughout the whole movie. So, um, I mean, hands to you for that. But you, <laughs> well, thank thank you. Actually, that's re that's really funny that you you mentioned that because you know, Stacy's not in real life a mother and at, at that time was not a mother. And so one of the things she wanted to know is like, well, how do I like touch a child? How would a mom touch a child? Right. But one of the restrictions uh, with working with, uh, you know, I just like, how would you pick her up? How would you hug her? How would you, whatever. Um, I just don't have that personal experience except for when I'm a child with my mother, which is, you know, different, right. Than being the mother. So uh, one of the restrictions though, I, I had very little time because of Audrey's process because she was so young and she wanted to keep it pr fresh. One of the uh, kind of like caveats was almost no rehearsal before we went to shoot Al almost no rehearsal so i said well i'm used to rehearsing things a ton um before we go out to shoot so i was like wow okay so no rehearsal so what do we do so heidi said well we can come for camera tests and we can record voiceover in advance so i said aha we're going to record all the lines for the whole movie voiceover to have them before we film it all and so that was my rehearsal time so we got stacy and audrey in the booth uh, together and they recorded all their lines for the whole movie. Um, we didn't use all of them for the movie, we used some of them for the voiceover, but they recorded all of the lines of the whole movie in the booth that had it. It was very helpful actually to have that. And um, the entire time I was like, okay, while recording, Audrey, I just want you to take your hand and just like put it somewhere on Stacy, like her face or something, or like just like, just to get used to contact between the two of them, or like, why don't you just like grab her knee while she's talking? And it was like, <laughs> it, was, it was really funny. So they were goofing around um, and, and really just getting to know each other a ton while they were going through, and they really developed a, a bond going through it. So that was kind of like our time for them to play and get to know each other. And that, and some camera tests we did for, because Stacy had very extensive makeup and so did uh audrey as their alter egos so while we were doing their camera test for alter egos again we were like okay you guys play um patty cake for the next you know half hour while you get ready and they they really got to know and enjoy each other's company um and i i think it's funny because they're you know it's a very very tense fraught film like very very tense full of emotion there's a little bit of humor, but it's it's not not a ton. It's not like there's no like there's only a couple like laugh. You know, there are a lot of places where you're just gonna like laugh out loud here. But what was great is in their process and in her process, they just found each other. They they were able to play and so uh, and and enjoy each other, and so they were able to go in and play, but also like get in and do some real work acting together. I think that time bonding beforehand was what we needed. <laughs> yeah <clears throat> yeah so uh <laughs> well um i'm i'm glad that uh <laughs> that was the sounded like an experiment that worked out though so <laughs> that's good to know uh so uh, a little bit about your film uh because i just realized we hadn't told anybody a little bit about your film tell us a little bit about your film sure oh yeah that's funny so we'll go a little backwards um <laughs> my film uh sma my love it's based pretty much people uh, on on two things it's kind of it's based on some true events some actual events um but it's like an amalgamation of two things so the first thing it's primarily about um or inspired by is uh, a woman I, I can't name exactly who she is for privacy reasons but she told me the experience she had when she had her first 
daughter, um, she told me the experience of seeing an angel. And when she told me the story of the circumstances of what actually happened, she told me that story. I was like, that sounds terrifying (laughs) because if I was in that situation, I'd be screaming and throwing things and be like, what, what's happening? And she goes, no, 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 you don't understand. This wasn't scary. This wasn't terrifying. Cause she, she told the story where there's just, again, so something I found incredibly terrifying, but she was like, this is the most beautiful thing that I've ever experienced. This was, this was the closest I've ever gotten to seeing God. And I was like, wow. And it kind of stuck with me for years, her story, because I found it very scary, but she was like, no, this is the most beautiful thing that ever happened to me in my life. So that, that really stuck with me. And um, so I would think about that a lot and it would just kind of come to me while, you know, I, I do a lot of camping with my wife and it would come to me while we were camping. I'd think about it a little bit. And um, then uh, fast forward, uh, I had some ideas for this film but we were shooting a music video uh, up in this place called Hague, New York, which is where we filmed my film. Um, and it was just the most beautiful location in the world. I just fell in love with this space. It was an, an abandoned family farm. And the drummers, the drummers family, they kind of own this beautiful wooded area in Hague, New York. And um, we're shooting this music video, having a lot of fun. And I get to talking with the drummers family and we really hitting it off. And Turns out his mom, Sally, is the town historian. I was like, okay. And I'm a curious fellow. And um, I was helping produce the thing. And I get to talking to the town historian. And I just get 100 years of the family and town history, you know, in, in a couple of sittings that were just like fascinating. And so she actually had a great grandmother named Hannah. And Hannah had a St. Christopher's medal. And the story, the actual family history story is um, when Hannah was a little girl, um, some gypsies came to town and uh, Hannah looked a little bit different than the rest of the family because she was only one of the family with red hair. And um, some gypsies came to town and, uh, you know, they were doing whatever trading and, and whatever. And then when they're going to leave town with their with their wagon, the neighbors notice, hey, there's a, there's a little girl with red hair in that wagon. And they realized they were running off with Hannah. They had stolen the daughter. And so they circled up the horses and they go stop the, the, uh, the wagon. They get, they get their daughter back. And in her hand was a St. Christopher's medal. And uh, I didn't know this, but St. Christopher is the patron saint of travelers, wanderers, and children. And so that became a very special thing. They're like St. Christopher was watching over Hannah. And they passed that heirloom down and they still had it. And they said, I said, wow, that's amazing. And they said, do you want to use it in your movie? And I said, yes, please. (laughs) So the St. Christopher storyline and actual prop was a family story and heirloom that we kind of brought into our story. Okay. And and the character is named uh, after that real woman. So you take those two events, the... um, the uh, woman with her first time seeing an angel and this family's history. And we kind of put those together. Um, And if you just want a quick recap of what my movie, or just a quick, you know, byline of what my movie is about the elevator pitch or whatever, it's uh, when Hannah sees the symptoms of a terminal illness in her daughter, she decides it's time to take her to, the family farm uh, and let her know about the past, let her know who she is, um, let her know some things and try to connect uh, before they have to say goodbye. Um, The thing I would say is that's the written kind of synopsis, but I also have a trailer. And if you watch the trailer and you read the synopsis, they kind of clash with each other and that's on purpose. So uh, my, my nerdy, film mind is please read the synopsis and watch the trailer and then you really get what the movie is about uh if you just have one or the other it doesn't quite 
get there. I, I tried to figure out a way to do it just writing it, and I tried to figure out a way to doing it just in the trailer, and I just couldn't do it. So I was like, okay, guys, you got to do, you got to look at both, <laughs> and that's where I settled at. It's not the easiest thing for the audience. I apologize, but that's 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 really if you truly want to know what the the movie's about, you kind of have to read the little synopsis and watch this eighty eight second trailer. So, uh, <laughs> so then. Everything you just said didn't work for me because when I watch the movies, I don't read what any of them are about, and I never watch the trailers. I just go <laughs> in blind. Uh, <laughs> so. Well, but go, but see, that's good. Going, I think you can go into my movie blind. I actually, I actually prefer it. I, yeah. I prefer people going. But if people are like, "What's it about? What do I know?" I'm like, "Well, it's a mystery. I don't want to tell you what the answer to the mystery is. You know, it's a thriller. Um, so I, I, I keep it pretty vague." Yeah, that's exactly why I don't read any of that before I watch the movies. And I watch a lot of indie movies <laughs> uh, for our film festival. So uh, I, I, I can't do that. I like to be surprised. Um, uh, indie cool. films indie surprise me the most. So I tend to not want to know anything until I watch it. So I, I, like, I like that you guys uh, always surprise me with new and interesting stories and uh, ways of, uh, of, of doing your story, which is uh, one of the reasons why I want to get to the next place, your, your choice of location. We've already talked a little bit about you spending almost two years rewriting your script to fit the location. I'm about to say that's an amazing location. Tell me a little bit about that. So, yeah, we, so we, we after we found location, we actually spent about a year, but what we did was we went back up to the farm and we said, Hey, you know, Sally, we're, we're thinking about, you know, writing, you know, bringing this movie here. Can we, can we stay with you? Talk a little bit more. And the farmhouse that figures in the movie, the kind of dilapidated farmhouse that Esme goes and explore in the attic. I mean, that's kind of how it looked like in the attic. Mm -hmm. It was just kind of crazy. And it kind of looked that way in the basement. I mean, we moved a few things around here and there, but it was this just like insane building because it's still standing. Um, but there's parts of the building. They're like, don't go in these rooms. Don't go in these rooms. This used to be this. The floor is weak here. Like, you know, this X, Y, Z. Like, if you walk here, you'll just fall through the ceiling. You know, that sort of thing. So we actually had to X off some of the areas that were not safe to walk on. But then um, when we went through the space, my co-writer and I, uh, Laura, it, it's funny, I had tried at, I tried out many, I had this kind of like vague idea and I wanted to work with a co-writer. Um, and so I'd gone with like three or four different people and then I finally really gelled with Laura and we went, came to the space and um, it's kind of this farm house and then surrounding old farmland and campground, previous campground land. And we just kind of walked around and and saw all the different things and we put them all out on a map and we said, okay, we want to see here at the big rock. We want to see here at the little boat. We want to see here at the dock. And then we started kind of taking the ideas that we already had and seeing what fit and put them in a space. And, and then we thought about other spaces like, Oh, what, what about the big hole? Let's do something with this big hole. And, you know, like, and then we, we, um, kind of took all the, the image, the, the, we knew where we were starting, we knew where we were ending, and we knew all the things we wanted to put in it, and then we needed to figure out the right way to connect it, and um, being in the space, and actually like sleeping in the space, uh, allowed us, with a very, very modest budget, you know, I think that's one of the hardest things, when, uh, when I, sometimes when I go into a movie, I think, this is how I want it to be, and now I'm going to build this, and I think building that space from, from nothing would have cost about a million dollars. But since we wrote to the space, it's just that like that. <laughs> and I think that was really, really helpful. Because, you know, if you're like, okay, let's, let's just grab a big boat, drag it out to the middle of the woods, cover it with moss and drop it down, you know, or let's get a really abandoned card from the junkyard and drive it up and set it on fire and then drop it here. You know, there were just so many cool things that were there already that we decided to uh, write to them rather than try to force our way into it as an indie film crew with, with a very small crew. Um, we didn't have the means to create the world so we wanted to exist and 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 work within the world that was there with obviously a few things that we created and changed but 
things that were uh, manageable with a small crew. Um, I think my big, my biggest, uh, my biggest uh, success, I guess, the, the most exciting thing is like, you know, if you're going to do something to a car in a movie, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's not the easiest thing to do. So I think our biggest success was was really making that uh, what happens to the car uh, successful. And, and I'm not going to want to give away what happens to the car. But <laughs> this, this, The interview is not to give away stuff. We want people to watch the film. <laughs> they may watch the interview first, but we need them to watch the film, too. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, well, you bring up a great a great thing that you did is you uh, you had a script and then you wrote or you augmented the script based on a location that you went to, um, which saved you on money and made for a much more interesting film, uh, in my opinion. Uh, instead, because when you have that little idea that you actually went to these locations and they're dilapidated and they look this way, uh, it adds a different aesthetic to the film. And it puts you in a different mindset instead of saying, oh, wait, this is all looks like a set that they created on a soundstage. It doesn't feel real. Um, the way that your characters are in the, the nature and out there in the wild made everything feel realer. And because it's an indie film, it, you, you just get engrossed in the story because of all that. Because you're not thinking, oh, wait, there's uh, that's a fake that's a fake background in the window there you can tell it's fake it's on the sound stage stuff like that when you're watching the movie you're watching it and say this feels real this feels like these people are living here that this it, it, it adds to the aesthetic and the enjoyment of the film itself so uh and when you did this it's like it's just a a call for some of the younger filmmakers out there who may not have had this experience before um and they're working with a limited budget like you were it's like you can go out there and find these amazing locations to shoot at and just kind of tailor your script to some of these locations to give it a, a, a different feeling and a different aesthetic so that when people are watching it, then they'll feel like they're watching like the, the latest MCU film that was shot on the soundstage and everything CGI, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, that was actually very, really important to us is that almost every almost everything was 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 physical and, and tangible and in the real world that that was something that was that was very very important to us because yeah we, we knew we weren't going to be even though it's there's a lot of magical realism in there we knew the magic had to actually happen for most of the for most of the film because if we tried to do too many special effects outside of our budget it would just not feel real yeah yeah so whew. <laughs> were there any, were there any challenges shooting uh, on all your locations at all, or was everything? Yeah, okay. no, absolutely. <laughs> so, um, one of the most scary things uh, that that happened at one point. Um, so, my little girl's uh, allergic to the little girl in the movie Audrey. She's allergic to bees. Um, there were not bees in 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 the in the top of the attic, but there was wasps that were that were nesting in the space and. We knew this like a couple days before shooting, so we got an exterminator. We went through a day to got rid of the wasps or whatever because we were just very, very scared of whatever. They were shooting in in the attic. The wasps came back and they were like building their nest, and we're like, oh my gosh! And I knew she wasn't allergic to them, but she's a nine year old girl. You know, she doesn't. She just sees the flying things. She's like, I'm allergic to bees. This is really scary. Um, Unfortunately, she actually got stung by one of the wasps right by the window uh, during one of the scenes, and she was so scared. And I just remember going, and and um, one of my crew members is also allergic to bees and thought it was a bee and starts yelling, "That's a bee! That's a bee!" And then I'm like, and then her mom's like, "Get the epipen!" And I'm like running down to the emergency first aid kit, getting the epi. And and like Audrey, she's hyperventilating. She's going, ah, ah, you know, because she thought she'd been stung by something she was allergic to. She was very scared. And so we had to take her out. I gave her the, the um, you know, the medicine real fast. But that also kind of knocks you out and sedates you, you know. <laughs> so so she because, you know, all the adrenaline and then the epic pen and the Benadryl. So after like calming down and I was like, don't worry, we know these are wasps. We know they're not bees. And we actually killed it. And she saw it was and she calmed down. But we, I was sitting there with her mom and her in my car because i was away from the crew just just sitting there and we we're just sitting there with the ac going 
it's okay. It's okay. She calmed down. She stopped hyperventilating. And I was like, okay, now you got three more hours of filming. You ready? <laughs> and it was amazing because not only was she like, okay, but she was like phenomenal. She knocked it out. I mean, if, if you're talking about a credit to Audrey, it was after that. It was coming back from that bee sting, or not bee sting, so the wasp sting, coming back from that sting, um, getting all Benadryled up, and then coming back onto set and just killing it. And I think that was one of the biggest challenges, but also one of the biggest victories. And a lot of it just speaks to just like what a pro, even at nine years old, Audrey was. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> so I want to get a little, little bit about the, uh, the post-production because this is very important to me only because your film has only the two main characters, but your editing was, uh, I, I don't want to say great, because that's not a great word, but the the pacing for the whole film was such that I lost your I lost your vote your voice for a second. I can't hear you. Okay, oh, you hear me? I can't now? hear you. I think you muted yourself. Uh, no. Can you hear me? Now, now you're back. Now I got you back. Oh, okay, that was weird. So uh, I wanted to uh, get to just discuss some of the because did you do the editing or did you have an editor do it or? Well, so one of the reasons why it actually took so long to make the film, I'm used to editing myself. But for something with this magnitude and just kind of this and just what was going on in my life at the time, there was no way I was going to be able to edit myself. I needed to find an editor to work with. I was too close to the material with all the pre-production. I knew I needed to work with an editor, but it was really interesting. The editing process was crazy. And one of the reasons it took so long is, uh, well, one thing, I got into this really exciting program called the Edit Center. Um, and it's got a, a, a long history. And what it does is they're teaching up and coming editors how to use Avid and they use your footage as a test subject. And uh, films that have gone through the edit center are uh, uh, Beast of the Southern Wild. It's one. Um, the Gen Jennifer Lawrence film, what is it? It was uh, one of her really early ones where she's a little kid on a mountain. It's something river or like frozen something uh i i'm blanking but it's oh. it's there's some date uh what's it called uh it's the one i it, yeah it's one of her earliest ones that got noticed I, I can't think of the name of it the, it's I, on the tip of my tongue but it's a fantastic film and there's a scene where it's day for night and we actually the look that they use in that day for night was inspiration for our day for night um um, so I get into this I get into this program I'm like great we're gonna get a rough cut through here right and my film is challenging and so you know they say at the end of the program you get accepted uh, you're gonna have a rough cut i get through and they're like okay here's your rough cut i was like this is 30 minutes long and i i, I and like so each student did like a different scene and they're like yeah but it was challenging here 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 and here so here you are and i was like well that's cool actually because i got really familiar with the footage and um i got some ideas like from different people um, and I met some just amazing people through that process, but I didn't really have a cut. And that process didn't even have a really assembly. I didn't even have a full assembly at that point. Um, that process took about, I don't know, six, eight months. So that that was kind of like at the end of it, I thought I was going to have an assembly and then move to a, a finishing editor to work with. But so really, I was like, OK, I got to find an editor to work with. I had some people in mind that I wanted to work with um, that I worked with in the past. and. Um, just wasn't jibing and it was really interesting it wasn't jibing because they the person i was working with would be like movie's got to go this way i was like okay but i'm the director and i'd like to just try this and they're like no i feel really like they get so into the story and the space they didn't want they were like it has to go this way i was like oh that's not going to work out but it's funny i thought it was just this person right that happened with three other editors there was just something about this story and the material that they were like, no, it has to be this way. And I was like, well, that, that's not my vision. I'd like to try. And I've never experienced that with an editor before. And these are people I know and like. And it was just like, it's just not working. So eventually, I settled on it. My, I have two editors who did the film, Emrys and Ellie. And what I said was, hey, I'm working with another editor. You're not allowed to talk to them. 
And I'm like, what? That's weird. And so what I do is I work with one editor. I would work with Emerson on this part of the film because we had already had a lot of work to start off with. Just wasn't quite right. Um, so I'd work with Emerson on something. And when he got to that point where he's like, no, the film's got to go. So he's like, okay, let's put a pin on it. And I'd take it over to Ellie and be like, hey, Ellie, let's work on this part of the film. This is how I want it to go. And Ellie would be like, all right, let's go at it. And it was funny. Then at some point she'd be like, no, nah, it's got to go this way. And I was like, hold on, let's put a pin on it. I go back to Emerson. I'm like, okay, Emerson. Here's what we did. Here's what I got. Like, and it's funny. I did not let them talk to each other for the first six months we were working on the film. We get this awesome assembly, and they said, "Okay, let's all meet." <laughs> like, when we, for whatever reason, people got so close to the material, they weren't. I, I just, it was just weird, and it made me excited because the story was very exciting, and and it was like this beautiful process. But um, I was also just like, "What's happening?" That's not how it's supposed to go. Like the director's supposed to say, let's do it this way and let's go. And the editors are supposed to like, you know, give their thoughts, but like eventually, but there was this awesome synergy that we got with it when it was like, okay, let's put a pin on this. And I was able to move from editor to editor and get my assembly. And once, once I got my assembly, then we all met and we refined from there as, as a team. And it was really exciting and fun, but it took me a long time to crack that editing. Um, and uh, I am very proud of the editing. And I think actually both Emrys and Ellie and actually the people who beforehand who didn't actually end up working out uh, because there were like six editors on the project. Um, they didn't all do the entire film, but there were like six editors who had worked on it or, or whatever. They, there were just like some really good ideas that were brought forth by, I'd say probably everybody. And so, but Emerson and Ellie were the ones who kind of took it to the finish line with me and also came up with a lot of really good stuff. There were some, there's one scene in particular that's a huge, very important scene in the film in terms of making the whole film work. And I wouldn't say it's the best scene in the movie, but without that film, without that scene, I don't think the whole film works just narratively. It's, it's all in wide it's all in wide. It's this kind of like baptism like scene where uh, it's all in wide. And they're anyways, uh, that was written. And that's so exciting. That was written in post because we had a different scene or a couple other scenes that weren't working. And I was like, uh, Emrys came up with the idea and I was like, oh, now the movie works. Because we were sitting there like we've been working on this. We're in this oh, movie doesn't work. Movie doesn't work. Movie work. We got that baptism scene. We put it in. And I was like, oh, here's the movie. And that was super, super exciting because we loved everything, but it just wasn't fitting. And then we put that baptism scene, and it's really funny because it's all in wide. I wrote the dialogue, and we brought Audrey and Stacy back into the booth three years later, recorded all the dialogue for it. And Audrey had to kind of like talk like a little girl, and she's like, I don't remember what I sounded like when I was nine. And I was like, just try to speak really high, please. Um, but she, she pulled it off as, and I think she did a pretty good job. Um, but yeah, that shot was actually Bob, my secondary cameraman was like when he was doing his nature documentary stuff, he ended up being on the other side of the lake while we were doing some prep for a scene. And he was like, Oh, this looks cool. And he let the camera roll. And that's the scene that saved my story. Oh, wow. Uh, so, so that was that was something where you have like a a very uh emers comes from a documentary film editing background so one thing that he did that i really appreciated that some of the narrative film editing editors did not do is he's like well let me look at all the things that are happening before and after somebody says you know action and cut let me look at everything before and after action and cut and he found that footage in the B cam stuff where it was kind of like the assistant editor had kind of thrown it out. He's like, well, this is like 40 minutes long. Why, 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 what are we doing with this stuff? And then he's like, oh, here's the scene we needed. So I think without having a documentary film editor um, helping, and Ellie comes from like a musical theater and narrative film background. And I think just like having them work together you know, most independent filmmakers and they think I need to find my editor, my single editor. And all my advisors are like, let me just find a single editor to do this with you. Well, I can just tell you for me, I needed two editors. And I, and it and until I figured that out for myself, um, I was just spinning my wheels, spinning my wheels, spinning my wheels, wondering what was going on. 
And then when we cracked that code, um, I think the movie fell into place. Nice. That's a, that's a very interesting story because uh, you're right. There are a lot of uh, filmmakers out there who would say, but you seem to find this one editor, this one editor to edit my film. And even I have gone through films where I've gone through, I think three editors is the most I've ever gone through, where I, I just wasn't feeling, we weren't gelling, so I had to switch off. Uh, it's interesting. I never thought about using two for the same film, though. That's ne- I've never done that before. That's very interesting. Hmm. It was great. And, you know, I, I, I look at some, uh, you know, some people who are working on bigger films and it's very common, you know, to have uh, assistant editors who are doing like heavy lifting on television shows. And and, you know, you've got a main editor with like four assistants or whatever, but who are bringing a lot to the table. And yeah, it just kind of, you know, I kept on looking for, oh, who's that unicorn who's going to get that mind meld with me? And it's like, well, maybe it's very difficult because what's in my brain is kind of weird right now. But also, <laughs> um you know, maybe I, I should just try to look outside of whatever box I'm trying to put myself in into. And as soon as I did that, it really helped. But yeah, it, it was a, a long post-production process. We were, so we shot in, so it was like, we started writing in like 2016 or 15. We shot in 2018 and we had our first real cut of the film in the end of Two thousand two in the spring. Hmm. Wow! So, so it's a six-year process for the film. You know, six-year process. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I can say this: that it was uh, the process that you went through was definitely worth it. I'm, uh, you know, thank you. Patience on having a completed feature uh, that has entertained all of us at uh, something wicked uh, because. Uh, this happened to be one of the one of our biggest years for feature length uh, submissions. We don't usually get nearly as many, but this year I think we had a whopping forty to choose from. And so some of my like, uh, which ones do we choose? We normally it, it, we only usually screen six, maybe eight at the physical film festival because we don't have enough time uh, slots. Yeah, I was like, oh, uh, guys, we got to really hammer down on the. The, the the top eight because uh we can't scream wow. those 40 freaking features so um no. no i mean that that's just my that's one of my opinions since i don't i don't have to do with the, i have nothing to do with the judging aspect of our film festival i have all the fun doing the best of uh the festival screening like when i help choose those uh and then me and my guys and ladies help choose uh, the uh, festival director awards. So we have fun doing the fun awards. We let the jury. Uh, I, the main- <laughs> I, I'm, I'm so excited and, and honored to be in this festival. It seems like such a cool festival. I, I mean, the only thing I regret, well, not regret, but like I hope to, I hope to have stuff to submit in, in future years so we can come down in person and actually go down. Because yeah. first of all, love the festival name. Uh, <laughs> love, love the selection. Something wicked. That's just a great name. Um, also just like I said, I've got my, got my guy in Georgia. Um, so, you know, <laughs> I'd love to come down, hope, hopefully some, you know, sometime in the future, uh, after this movie, um, my next project I'm, I'm working on right now, it's a narrative, uh, a c- serial narrative podcast right now, because, um, it's kind of like, uh, a thriller, uh, but it's not. Esme, my love was kind of my, um, for lack of better words, like uh, highbrow, artsy fartsy, just do what I want as an auteur, you know, do what something like I really want to do, um, movie that I'm, I'm just going to do everything I need to make it, get it there. And I'm very happy I made it. Um, my next project, I want to show folks that I can be more genre. Um, so I'm still doing a a, a, scene, a scene that, or not scene, like a, a theme and a and a, a subject matter I, I like and love, which is kind of like horror, mystery, suspense, thriller. Um, but this is going to be much more genre piece where you go into it and you're like, I know where I am, right? So as may my love, you kind of get there and you're like, where am I? It's a slow burn mystery. Okay. Uh, my next piece, which is going to be this eight part um, horror series, 
is going to be much more genre and it's about an evil cartoon duck that's the nemesis and so it's like two sisters versus this evil cartoon duck and its name is demo duck um and uh demo is the name of like a popular kid show but this is like the evil version of that popular kid show duck and so it, it's going to be a lot more kind of um it's going to be an anthology so there's going to be some things that feel a little a little buffy the vampire slayer some things that feel a little x files some things that feel a little twin peaks you know but it's going to be people know where they are uh, immediately um as opposed to you won't have to do as much work as an audience member i feel like my my feature film uh i i kind of make the audience do a lot of work with my with my uh with esme my love um so i want to show people i can do something uh commercial so that's my next project yeah. well good because that was one of the questions i'm going to ask you what you were working on next so <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, is there anything you want to leave with the audience in regards to your film? Any thoughts, any uh, final words? Because it's been a pleasure talking with you this hour. Yeah, yeah, I really enjoyed speaking with you as well. Yeah, I'm so excited and grateful to be part of this festival. I think it's really cool. I'm, I'm really excited to see everybody who's in the festival's pieces. I'm, to be very honest, I'm probably not going to watch them all, but I've picked out some ones that I really, that I really like, uh, or that I like the look of. I'm excited to watch a bunch of them. Um, one of my favorite things about film festivals is that you really get to see content that you either see it first or you see it where no one else sees it. Mm -hmm. And some of the, some of the, the movies that have really influenced me as a filmmaker are outside of this kind of, uh, mainstream box. Um, particularly short films, right? Uh, you don't really get to see short films anywhere other than, than film festivals right now. Um, but even a lot of the, the, the feature films that I've seen um, in festivals are really excited. I'm very excited to see some of the, the fe uh, feature films in, in, in this one as well. So I think uh, if, I, if I'm gonna leave anything with this interview is thank you so much for having us as part of this festival. It's a huge honor. Well. It was a pleasure talking with you. And, uh, well, I the one thing I do want to say is I hope that your film has a very successful festival run. Uh, so please uh, keep us in uh, in the loop on wherever your film goes. Uh, what we like to do is we like to make sure that uh, audiences, if they missed your film in our film festival, can at least figure out where they can watch it next if the movie doesn't get distribution soon. A lot of films... And if it gets distribution, go ahead, tell us that too. We will make sure to advertise it so that our people who saw it can enjoy it again. And people who didn't get a chance to see it this time can watch it. Because in the three days our festival is, there's a lot of content to watch. So Yeah. <laughs> so, so actually, that, that's one thing I am going to be doing um, in, at the end of August. Um, so in the middle of August, we're going to be screening in, in the theater in, um, in, in New York City. Uh, on August 10th in the Regal Cinema as part of a uh, festival of cinema. Um, and then in September, we'll be screening in the Prospector Theater in Connecticut, which I'm very excited about. Um, but then for the folks who can't make it to New York City or, or you know, Prospector, Connecticut, um, we're going to be doing a virtual private screening uh, at the end of every month for the next six months, a virtual private screening. And you can access that at EsmeMyLove.com. There you go. So, so for the folks who can't make it out to, 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 you know, can't see it for the three days here um, at the end of each month, we're going to take two days, make the, make the movie accessible at a virtual private event, not open to the public, but you can get your tickets. Uh, you know, you can get your tickets there at Esme, my So uh, yeah, when, when those come out, uh, I'll, I'll make sure to uh, post it on our um, social media pages. And so we can get more people to watch your film. So uh, well, it's been a pleasure, and uh, like I said, I hope uh, wish you and your film nothing but uh, continued success, and I hope to see the next film from you soon. Okay. Thank you, man. Enjoy your marathon speaking to like five thousand people for an hour each. Um, <laughs> it's it's going to be crazy for you, and I know that you got a young kid coming home soon, so that's amazing. Kudos to you. It is, which is um, why I'm all this early so that my uh, my 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 partner can take care of all the other stuff. 
<laughs> speaking, speaking of whom, I got to get home to my partner now because she's like, you're doing what? And I was like, she's like, you realize you got a one-year-old home right now? I was like, okay, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. So uh, I got to get out of here too. So have a good one. All right, you too. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Thank you.